So we start with the, with the presentation, brief introduction of this Nadima, Dr. Saghi, and I will also briefly introduce our speakers and also discuss and you and Alexander. And uh, uh, then uh, the plan is that we start with Francisca Holtz on Paris Agreement and resource rich economy is very interesting and very also timely topic. Uh, Christian also has a nice paper on the night light and measuring the disaster costs using these satellite pictures. It's also quite ex exciting topic. I recently also have used a little bit of this data uh, in a different context on the effects of sanctions on Iranian shadow economy. So, uh, and uh, Marcel uh, has also very nice uh, contribution recently on the um, uh, obligatory insurance uh, for natural disaster in Germany. I told him that uh, in Iran just uh, recently, in this year, they also approve uh, uh, obligatory insurance against natural disaster, uh, but everybody pay a similar premium. So all households need to pay that. Uh, 30 million households, and um, but 50% uh, of that government, 50% the people. So we will discuss that later on when the Marcel uh, uh, also shares his views. Dr. Farah, um, let me go. it's 2.30 in here, so we are going to start now yes. or we will wait more? Uh, we can start. We have uh, now uh, close to 26 people. And uh, uh, if you agree, we can uh, we can start, huh? I don't know. I'm and just asking. more people, more people will also come. So we have different time zones here. So Iran, Germany, sometimes is rather uh, difficult. Uh, yeah, but, I just reminded uh, the time. So it's uh, it's up to you. It's uh, two yes. thirty one. Yes, we can. Now, exactly, we are going to keep the time, and uh, I welcome uh, everybody in this event, uh, from speakers, from uh, also the discussant, Dr. Sari, the co-moderator, and the Nadima team, the people from Iran and Germany. Uh, my name is Mohamed Farzanegan, and together with Dr. Sari and three uh, speakers uh, who kindly accepted uh, the invitation to join us for the concluding event of Nadima project, which is a project uh, initiated in Marburg and uh, got assistance and uh, collaboration from partners in Iran and Germany, um, uh, and supported by the AD and also the Amt in Germany um, since 2020. It's about natural disaster management, uh, learning from experiences in Iran and Germany, and our partners in Iran, University of Tehran, uh, and the uh, uh, Strong Motion Network, uh, which Dr. Esahi will uh, elaborate that, that part more. So uh, my task now is to introduce our speakers, uh, who uh, his plan is that uh, for 50 minutes presentation, and then after presentations, we would have uh, close to 40, 45 minutes, question and answer and discussions, which I hope that we uh, enjoy that part as well. Uh, with us are uh, Francisco Holtz, uh, who is the deputy head of energy transportation and environment department from Deutsche Institute uh, for which of Forschung in Berlin, DEV, and uh, in that institute she's coordinating the research area related to the resource and environmental markets. She is also adjunct professor at the Norwegian University of Technology since 2018, and uh, she was also professor of governance uh, for energy and infrastructure at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. Uh, for 2015-2016. Uh, she studied economics in Sorbonne and uh, she got her PhD from TU Berlin in 2009. She will talk about Paris Agreement and how this agreement affects the resource rich economies. Uh, and uh, when um, uh, she concludes the presentation, we would uh, please to listen to Christian Lissman. Uh, Christian is uh, also 
professor of international economics at TU Dresden, uh, at the same time research professor at uh, IFU Institute, uh, University of Munich, and uh, a member of CECIFU Research Network. Uh, he was a professor of economics before joining TU Dresden at TU Branch White and uh, also at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg. Um, he has done much work on the development economics and political economy, and I know him also during my PhD time in Dresden since several years ago. Uh, finally, Marcel Thum, uh, who is the professor of economics and the director of IFO, IFO Dresden, IFO Institute Dresden, uh, will talk about uh, the important topic of insurance against natural disasters and how that should work in Germany. And I guess that is also quite very relevant for case of Iran. Uh, Marcel Thum, of course, has a very long CV and uh, uh, many publications that uh, uh, basically, uh, due to the time, may, we may not go into details of that, but um, uh, I had the opportunity also, Christian, that we wrote our PhD dissertation under his supervision, and uh, it was one of the uh, best, uh, basically, uh, uh, things which could happen in my academic uh, career was uh, knowing about uh, Marcel Thum in 2005 and 2006, which I came to Germany with the other uh, program. Uh, and uh, today also we are presenting a project which is supported by the other Deutsche Akademische Ausstattung, which we are very thankful for their support. Uh, also, not only this project, but uh, also uh, we had also another three years project with Iran under the name of Natural Resource Management from 2016 to 2018, which was also supported by DRD under the Higher Education Dialogue with Muslim countries. So uh, with me also Dr. Esaghi, Ati Esaghi from Iranian Strong Motion Network is here. So I also thank uh, her for joining us. After the presentations, of course, we have Professor uh, Alexander Fekete from TH Kold and Professor Tim Krieger from University of Freiburg, which would also join the discussions. Uh, so we have also the uh, uh, this uh, um, pleasure to uh, work with these two uh, colleagues also in Germany as a partner from uh, Nadima projects, and uh, we hope to continue this uh, collaboration also in 2022, in the third year of project. And I'm very uh, uh, happy that you're also here and uh, join the discussions. I also welcome everybody from Iran and Germany and other places who joined us uh, today in this event. Dr. Esari, uh, could you also uh, uh, give us some comments on, on from your side, and then we start with Francisca. Sure, sure. Uh, um, thank you for your explanation, Dr. Farzan. Again, I would like first to uh, say hello to everyone, and uh, I would like to welcome you all on the final panel of Nadima Project, uh, which is actually the number uh, 16, dialogue number 16. So I'm supposed to briefly introduce Nadima Project. For those who maybe are not really familiar with this project, so as Dr. Farzan again said, the project was originally proposed by economics of the Middle East Research Group at the University of Marburg, and has been now funded by German Academic Exchange Service, DAD. Um, I would like to say the full title because it shows uh, that it's a multidisciplinary project. Uh, the full title is Social, Economy, Cultural, and Technical Aspects of Natural Disaster Management. So from the title, you see we have different disciplines uh, engaged in this project. The aim is to boost the cultural and academic exchange through discussions and uh, presentation, workshop, uh, you know, different way of um, uh, dealing with the uh, 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 natural disaster management, uh, mostly, uh, especially for those countries that are partners, I mean, Germany and Iran. So we have uh, different cooperation partners uh, in, in either side. In Iran, as Dr. Parzangan said, we have University of Tehran and uh, the Road and Housing Urban Development Research Center, the place that I'm working at. Uh, last year, we had University Azad University as a partner as well. Um, so basically, the 
due to the pandemic, we had to do all our workshops and, and uh, lectures and all uh, uh, the planning in online and in digital way because uh, there was no other way to have it in person. So hopefully it will be changed. But for now, we had um, um, seven successful um, panel last year in 2020, the first year of the project. Uh, it was more like having lectures and then uh, question answer and discussion panel. And this year we had up to now eight uh, workshops. They were like two days workshops and, and we engage uh, the, the lecturers, the students, the different professors from both sides, either Iran or Germany. And um, um, uh, we try to um, engage uh, uh, from every discipline that is uh, uh, dealing with the disaster management. Um, uh, another thing that I should say is that uh, it's going to continue this project for the next year. So uh, hopefully if the situation with the pandemic um, uh, goes away, uh, we are going to change it to school. But if not, then we are going to continue or uh, or a project the, the way that it is now. I don't want to take much time because we are going to have three presentation. And then after that, we have the question answer panel and hopefully it will be an um, active uh, panel. So I don't take that much time. And later I will join in the um, question and answer and discussion panel. Uh, so Dr. Farzanagan, uh, maybe you can um, um, yes. Say, uh, or maybe uh, the next, uh, the first presenter, uh, they can start their presentation. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much, Dr. Esar. I just wanted to say that if there are comments and questions during each of these presentations, feel free to post it in Q&A box here. And then after all presentation, we collect and uh, address uh, your comments and questions. Thank you. So, Francisca? floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm sorry that my title here is a little um, uh, half covered, uh, but uh, uh, Mohammed already said my title. Uh, I want to talk about chances and obstacles uh, uh, from the in the Paris Agreement, the case of research rich countries. Uh, it's certainly a topic um, of interest for Iran. Um, but this is, was actually a paper that I prepared together with a number of colleagues, as you can see. Uh, earlier this year in the framework of, um, uh, let me try to move. Um, of, uh, <laughs> of our dialogue for um, climate change economics, uh, uh, which is a series of projects uh, and events done for the German Ministry of, um, of Research and Education. Uh, and we were a group that uh, a group of projects and, and researchers that deal with international climate policy. Um, and we did a series of events earlier this year, prepared this paper that has actually the same title as my presentation. Um, and I want to present a few insights from, from that paper. And you can find both the paper, but also at least the main event uh, on the website, klimadialog.de, um, if you're interested in more details. I only have uh, a few minutes, so um, I basically uh, prepared just four main messages uh, that may not be too surprising, but maybe uh, good for a starter for our discussion later on. Um, I want to first uh, uh, show that research rich countries are really not a homogenous group of countries, but a very diverse uh, set uh, of countries. Um, yet uh, we can say that pretty much all resource rich countries will be affected by revenue and welfare losses when their fossil fuel demand declines due to climate policy. Um, I will give some insights uh, that we sort of have evidence that research rich countries are aware of this threat to their welfare and that they act accordingly, mainly with low ambitions and global climate, global climate uh, negotiations. And I think we all saw that again at COP26 in Glasgow a few weeks ago. Um, and then as an outlook, I uh, want to briefly discuss that, uh, well, this may be a chance to actually overcome the resource curse that is another effect on research countries. Uh, this is a table from, from that report uh, where uh, we showed 
the top 10 countries for a number of uh, important indicators for yeah, what, can I, what are actually research rich countries. Uh, here you have the top 10 of uh, countries with a high share of fossil fuels in their exports or a high share of fossil fuels in their GDP. And often this is oil rents actually, so the third column is actually a high share of oil rents in their GDP. And another indicator that I find very important that is their fiscal resource dependency, so a high share of their state budget coming from uh, fossil revenues. And you see uh, there's a color code, and uh, the color code shows us the, that blue countries uh, are actually uh, those that the World Bank classifies as, as low or middle income countries, uh, and the green ones are those that the World Bank classifies as high income countries. And you see that uh, both types of uh, countries are uh, in those top 10 of those resource dependent uh, countries. Um, so really, it's hard to talk about resource rich countries as one homogenous group. They're very diverse. Um, yet it's still helpful uh, to uh, say, well, their resource dependency determines uh, some of their behavior, in particular related to climate policy. And we see that they are affected by climate policy, for example, from modeling results. Here, this is uh, uh, something that we picked up in the paper that's actually coming from one of our uh, uh, projects where um, colleagues did a model comparison effort with 15 CGE models, uh, modeling all the same scenarios essentially. And here, this is results from an, from an NDC scenario, it results in 2030 already, so relatively soon, with their nationally determined contribution, their own pledges um, uh, for climate policy efforts, so not extremely ambitious as we know, NDCs are really not ambitious at the, the moment at all. Um, and when we compare the outcome of their national, uh, of the country's national pledges to a business as usual scenario, uh, we see that there's a welfare loss in particular for those countries that are heavily dependent on fossil fuels. Here you have Russia uh, as a region, the Middle East, um, and this, they have much higher welfare loss uh, than, than the average, which you see here, or than other countries uh, that are less uh, fossil dependent. Um, uh, take uh, Europe here, sorry, yeah, Europe here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse actually, uh, uh, or um, uh, take uh, East Asian countries, for example. Of course, as I said, it's a diverse group of countries. You also have resource rich countries as US or, um, or Canada that have much lower um, welfare effect also from the NDCs, despite some of those NDCs actually being ambitious. Uh, uh, Canada has much more ambitious um, uh, NDCs uh, and then, than Russia or the Middle East. But it's understandable if you look at the welfare effect already just from those low ambition um, pledges. What you don't have on the slides, but what we also uh, discuss a bit in our report is that uh, if climate policies is not implemented just via NDCs, but via a global CO2 price, uniform price basically across uh, across economies, across the countries, then uh, those countries that are mostly dependent on oil and gas will actually sort of gain uh, in the first years uh, because the countries that are more dependent on coal are affected first. And they are affected with wealth losses uh, uh, to a much larger extent in the first years uh, than oil and gas uh, producers. Uh, clearly, the, the sort of energy market effect, the, the loss of welfare uh, from, from less revenue from energy markets uh, is really an effect that sort of dominates uh, abatement costs um, uh, if you look at global economies. So that sort of explains maybe to some extent uh, that uh, countries are countries that are resource rich have low ambitions in global uh, climate uh, negotiations. And that's not me saying that they have low ambitions. Uh, but it's actually um, a result uh, that we got from a survey done among climate negotiators and IPCC scientists, uh, where um, about uh, a thousand or so scientists were asked uh, before COP26, actually, around the time that COP26 should have taken place originally. Um, uh, they were asked to assess the ambition of, um, of uh, NDCs of several uh, country regions or countries. Um, the, yeah, with a ranking by, between one or zero for low ambition and five for high ambition. And the region that was best ranked was the European Union, relatively close to five, close to four. Uh, and those countries that are considered research rich, they were ranked as having a uh, poor or low ambition. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, um, the US, Russia, etc., all below, uh, well below three. Um, but that's not the only thing, that's probably not very surprising, but also the uh, self-assessment 
uh, of uh, uh, the NDCs by those of the, um, the climate negotiators coming from these countries uh, is uh, indicating that they are aware that they have low ambitions. So um, basically the question was, please evaluate the ambition of your host, of your home country. And we find, uh, again, pretty high ambition for the European Union and highest of everything that we have reported here and much lower ambitions for um, yeah, uh, OECD or richer research countries and then also for top 10 oil and gas coal producers. So really climate um, uh, negotiations suffer from uh, low ambitions of, uh, of resource rich countries and really as a specific group here. So this sounds like a really negative um, uh, sort of outlook and I wanted to give a little bit more of a, of a positive uh, uh, outlook, that the, the outlook that they demand reduction that may actually come with global climate policy if more and more countries now pledge climate neutrality towards 2050 and that comes with a reduction of their fossil fuel consumption given that about 89% of greenhouse gas emissions today come from fossil fuel consumption. Um, that this could actually tackle another problem associated with resource-rich countries, that is that they suffer from the resource curse. Uh, we know that uh, resource-rich countries suffer from macroeconomic instability, their um, budget, their GDP, their wage levels, etc. Everything moves with uh, their commodities, global price, often the oil price. Uh, they, we know that they suffer from low productivity and um, low uh, levels of industrialization speak of deindustrialization. And uh, more importantly, we know that many research countries have huge issues with poor institutions, so a lot of um, uh, revenue, rent seeking from elites, from just a few, no a small number of um, uh, resource companies. Uh, so we have really sort of an adverse um, characteristic uh, of the economies in, in research countries usually. There's strong resistance, of course, uh, to uh, um, to overcome this traditional business model and economic model, uh, because uh, that uh, social and economic models in place would be challenged, and then really those groups that benefit from the economic model in place that it's based on resources uh, is uh, has strong resistance. But the situation that we are facing now in the next decades with a climate policy-induced demand reduction for fossil fuel might actually help overcoming uh, that uh, traditional situation and that resource curse. And um, it's probably a moment where, um, yeah, international partners could seize that opportunity to, uh, um, to help those that are at the moment not benefiting from the resource uh, revenues um, to overcome resource curse and participate uh, better in the economic models of resource rich countries. So I wanted to give more of a positive outlook that climate policy does not only neg have uh, necessarily a negative effect uh, on resource rich countries, it might actually help overcoming a, a non-beneficial uh, economic model that we have uh, at the moment. And I will keep it there and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, if you agree, Francisco, I have myself some questions on the presentation i'm sure that the others may have also other questions but mm -hmm. we proceed to the next presentation by christian and then marcel and then at the end we would have the discussions for all presentations christian yeah uh, thank you very much Mohamed. Uh, thanks thanks a lot for the kind invitation uh, today I'm going to talk about a research project on the impact of natural disasters on development. And uh, as the title shows you, uh, I will show you a perspective from yeah, kind of outer space. So we lose, uh, we use satellite data to to measure the impact of disasters on the local economy. So that's a major point here in this uh, presentation. So. So, some facts uh, for the motivation. So it seems to be common knowledge that the climate change increases the frequency and intensity of natural disasters, at least if it comes to droughts or storms or something like that. Not necessarily, or of course not for for this type of disaster I will study here, which is, which are earthquakes. So these are definitely not man-made disasters. 
so their frequency, of course, will will not be affected by climate change. But um, I think we can learn a lot from 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 this uh, study here. And um, so the countries which are exposed to disasters, uh, they they might face lower economic growth, uh, which is due to a loss of human and physical capital. And, and we, if we look at the data, we will see that high income countries are um, a bit more resilient to to the to the effects of disasters. And um, the evidence in the literature until kind of recent studies came out, uh, it was not that clear on these uh, common knowledge that I presented just now, because they, they have some methodological issues. Um, for example, uh, um, up to 10, 10 years ago, people used emergency data or, or damage data to assess the effect of natural disasters. And, and these values in these emergency data, so how much damage was there or how, how, how high was the death toll, uh, that, that's highly endogenous because we know that the high income country is much more resilient. Uh, so they, they have better construction of buildings and all, all that stuff. So the, the death toll is usually lower compared to a developing very poor country. And also uh, on damages, of course, if you're richer, you will have higher insurances. Uh, so the, the, the damages me measured from the payments of insurances will also be much higher if the country is rich. Uh, that creates an indigenity problem, which needs to be solved. And what, what other authors have done, in particular, Gabriel Felbermeyer and uh, Yasmin Kreschel, they, they use geophysical event data on disasters. So not insurance data or data on dust toll. Instead, they just use physical dimensions. And if it comes to earthquakes, of course, it's the intensity of an earthquake on the Richter scale. And these earthquake intensities is then correlated kind of with, with, the, with the income losses or losses in growth of those countries. What has not been done until very recently was a the fact that they still aggregate everything to the country level and that is that is highly problematic I think you have an earthquake uh, in, a, in an unpopulated hinterland border region uh, you might not expect to have a strong impact on the development of a country so uh, what my argument is in this study is that the disasters are first and foremost a regional phenomenon so usually they hit the regions in a very asymmetric way so we should not uh, if we want to assess the impact of the disaster, we should not aggregate everything to the country level. We should instead work with regional data. And that is problematic, in particular in developing countries, because we don't have any reliable statistics on, on the regional development in those areas. And, and what I did in many research papers, and also in this exercise, is to use satellite nighttime lights as a proxy for uh, local development. So this graph here is taken from the Earth Observation Group. I can talk hours about the quality of the data and the limitations, and there are also very serious limitations in the data. But the takeaway here is that the advantage is that you get uh, highly objective data uh, in a very high resolution. So the re resolution of, uh, of, of one pixel in such a satellite image is about one square kilometer. So that helps us to really focus on the local dimension um, on the ground uh, of the Earth, uh, what, what's going on there. And um, one, one suggestive evidence is that the night lights have a, are a kind of proxy for economic development. It, it is an example of uh, Korea, the Korean uh, peninsula. And here on the left side, you see South and North Korea, the light emissions uh, between 1992 and 2008. And on the right side, you see some predictions for the economic activity and obviously you know um, North Korea is much poorer than than, than the south and, and that is also visible in the in the light emissions you also see some if I try to use a pointer here if, if you also see some artifacts in this light data so as I said I can talk about ours so th this is fishing yeah so fishing activity so fishing boats with very strong lights uh, that, that help the, that the fishes come to the surface of the water to pick them out. So there is obviously a link between the nightlight emissions and the income. But one argument that sometimes comes against using these nighttime lights is whether it really has to do something with the 
yeah, kind of with the, with the assets the households own? Is it really something which is also correlated on the micro level? And I did this study with a PhD student and a colleague from South Africa, uh, Thomas Ferreira, uh, on nightlights and household assets. So, so assets are, because usually in developing countries, you don't get any reliable reliable income data of households because they just would not answer those questions. If you ask a household in uh, Namibia, how much do you earn? You will not answer that question because he's afraid of uh, expropriation, expropriation. So they usually, if you need a wealth index, you ask for the assets the household owns. So do you have a, a cycle? Do you have a TV? Uh, do you have access to fresh water? All that stuff. And that could be aggregated to wealth indexes. And what we did here is, um, we had access to the complete census of Namibia, so of more than 2 million households. And, and that allowed us to do a very, very regional analysis uh, of the relationship between those nighttime lights, uh, which you see here as, uh, you know, these lighter pixels are, are more light emissions, and the assets owned by the households on the ground. And, and that was a kind of, I think, important analysis because what we found is that these nightlight emissions are correlated even on the one pixel level with the with the with the wealth of the households and that's something that couldn't be shown until until recently because you can use for example demography and health survey data but there is a kind of that's what you see here there's a kind of random displacement of the geocode where the households live and on the left side for example you see that the the, the red small dot is the location reported in the demography and health surveys of a household and then that is randomly displaced. It, it could match to a city where the household lives or not. And on the right side, you see the same for a urban, uh, for, a, for an urban area. And, and in this whole red circle, somewhere the household could live, but we don't know the exact location because it's kind of randomly displaced in order to ensure the anonymity of the people. But we have the data on these yellow things, and these are enumeration areas from the real, from the census, yeah? so from the exact census. Uh, so we can do a much fine, finer analysis of household wealth and, and nightlight emissions. And that shows to be really, there, there is a fairly high correlation. So these nightlights are a good proxy for economic development. So that brings us now to the question of the disasters. And I, I don't want to show you regression results. That's not so intuitive. What I want to do instead, I show you some interesting graphs. And here you see a large earthquake in Pakistan. It was in 2000, uh, by the end of 2005 or beginning of 2006, I don't remember. And it was fairly large, so it's 7.6 on the Richter scale. And it, it caused about 80,000 deaths, so it was a strong disaster. And on the left side, you see the satellite nightlight emissions prior to the event. And on the right side, you see it one year later. And in, in, in the yellow circles, I highlighted losses, obvious losses in, in the light emissions. And uh, you see that, of course, there, there is a negative impact. And we can also show that it continues. So it doesn't have only to do with access to electricity, which might be, which might be disconnected uh, after an event. So, but there, there's obviously a long-term effect. But what you also see is something which is difficult for such an analysis is these, these uh, light blue dot or whatever it is, this one here. Um, and this is the epicenter of the earthquake. So that's where the highest damage might, might occur. So this epicenter here has the exact coordinates and we know at this point, the intensity on the Richter scale. But all these tiny uh, lila points here, uh, these purple lila points, yeah, these are the aftershocks. Yeah? And the aftershocks could be as strong as the main event sometimes. So just the largest event is defined as the epicenter of the of the event. But you see many, many, many other shocks occurring out in, in different locations. And so one pixel is here one times one kilometer. So you see that it could be 20, 40, 50 kilometers away. A similarly strong event, uh, an almost similarly strong event. So what what we need to do if we want to analyze the local impact of these earthquake shock on the economy is we need to aggregate in space the energy the earthquake causes. And for this, we use a much finer grid than the satellite data. So this is, is I think it's 0 0.01 degree. That's a very, very small place. And we take the intensity of the 
design with the main event plus all uh, aftershocks. And we know from geophysical uh, studies what's the range, what's the distance of the what what the damage radius is, yeah? and then we circle the damage radius across all these events occurring in in that couple of days, and aggregate the energy intensity in space. And that's what you see here in these. Uh, three-dimensional, two-dimensional uh, plots. So we can aggregate the, the, the main event plus all the uh, aftershocks that occur. And what we then do is we take the nighttime lights and make regressions on the intensity that the earthquake had at the very local level. And what we did here is, for example, to analyze a one times one degree grid that is, um, that is about 100 square kilometers. And then we find very strong effects, and which is very suggestive. If we increase the size of the grid, then the effects get smaller. And what we can do here is, for example, we can completely ignore a country border. So that's really only a grid, a grid thing, but we can do it, of course, also at the country level and throw in fixed effects and all that stuff. So these effects of the disasters, they tend to hold for a couple of years. So in our data, it was five years. But that, of course, may depend on the effect size. So, so, and we had no, no lower bound for the earthquake. So even a very small earthquake with four or five on the Richter scale is included in our analysis. And what we can show, as other authors before, but now with this kind of different perspective on the regional economy, is that the national policies are very important. So. What we did is uh, we took these earthquake intensities, so the energy from an earthquake, and we built interaction variables with national uh, with, with, with national uh, indicators for development, savings rates, institu institutional quality, and all that stuff. And I just show you here two examples. Uh, on the left side is the interaction with institutional quality. And what you see here is then that the marginal effect of the earthquake on the cat and light emissions, so to speak, uh, that is that depends on on national institutions. Yeah? So so if a country has very poor institutions, uh, they tend to be less resilient to to the disaster. Or also, if the country is very poor, you see that these effects are much more negative than in richer economies. So obviously, development level matters to deal with the uh, to deal with the yeah, with the costs of a disaster in terms of these light emissions. So what is the takeaway of these uh, short presentations? The takeaway is that we have to think about the institutions that help to improve resilience. And what we cannot show in our analysis is what, what the exact mechanism that's, that's relevant here. So it could be that richer countries have a better emergency aid, uh, they could provide more insurance to the people so that they recover uh, quickly from from the shock, and that's that will be something Marcel Fimo will talk about in a minute. Could be think of Japan that they have a much more resilient construction. So in Japan, an earthquake with seven on the Richter scale or six point five will not cause much damage just because the construction is so good, the building quality is so good. So. That's something where we can speculate a lot around, but it's not clear which which is the kind of most cost effective instrument to to improve the resilience uh, of the countries against the natural disasters. So that's I think one takeaway. That's something we can discuss. The other takeaway is that uh, I want to highlight that the satellite imagery uh, we're using in our research it's very helpful to study the medium and long-term effects of disasters. So it's, it's currently used in, in, in the emergency aid. So if at any place on the world a disaster happens, then there will be immediately a call to all the organizations who run the satellites, and they will focus uh, kind of hours after the event on the exact locations to provide imagery, uh, which helps the, 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 the short-run disaster aid. So you see exact where the, where the damages are, and can send the people there to 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 help uh, others on the ground. So that's that's something where satellite data is currently used, but it can also be used for these more long-term perspective. And um, yeah, well, what are the sources you can use uh, to study? Um, so so what I did here in this paper is to use a kind of data set that runs from 1992 to 2013, and that's called. Um, Ordinary line scan, 
um, DMSP data that comes from the NASA. Uh, but because the satellite program was substituted by another one, a more recent one, the time series usually ends in 2013. And since then, there is a new set of satellites uh, that's called VIRS, Visible Infrared, da 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 da. And this data is, is much better in quality. It's monthly, you get monthly cloud-free images, which is very good. It's, it's all free, you can just download it from the NASA websites. Uh, and they are also pre-processed, so these cloud coverage and all that stuff is, is kind of calculated away if possible. And you get it well, yeah, also very quickly. So if you go to the website, you already find information for July 2021, which is just kind of four months ago. And if you would have such an immediate thing with economic statistics or, or, or official statistical data that will have much more, much larger lags. So you can use that data also for kind of short run analysis. And there's also, there are people, very intelligent people who made a merge of these old data with a new one. So then you lose some of the, the quality this new data had, provides, but then you get a complete time series from 1992 until until now and of course if you if you want to see what what happens on the ground not via nightlights but you will see the destruction observed the destruction of buildings for example or infrastructure you can use data and data and that is uh, for for very long time reasons available through the landsat program and you can directly go to google earth engine and and, and work with that data and the europeans have this copernicus sentinel program which provides also Free to use data, but that's so super large the data sets that you will only get snapshots of it. And one thing which is really incredible, but not that easy to access, is data from Planet Labs. And Planet Labs is a startup company located in the United States in Berlin. So, so initially it was a German project, and then they got a lot of investment to roll out it uh, in a much larger fashion. So, but ultimately it was a German thing. And this is a private company running about 150 satellites. And they start about 20 to 30 satellites uh, per year. And they are really small. So they call them doves. Uh, and they are kind of two, two liter volumes. So very tiny satellites that are circulating passively in, in the, in the, in the um, yeah, outside, you know, uh, or in space. There's no control of it. On, a, on them, but they have a very intelligent software that is able to combine out of all these tiny informations, um, pictures of, of the Earth. And that's really, they, they have for all eight hours per day, they can give you a picture with a resolution of three meters, which is very, very good. And they also have some larger satellites with a resolution of 70 centimeters uh, on, the, on the ground. And um, yeah, that's something which is which could be for disaster research really helpful. So you get really kind of live information on what's happening on the ground, but you will need very good cooperation partners that finance you to to get access to that data. So I hope that was a kind of inspiring talk to you, and that I'm looking very much forward to the presentation of Marcel, who gives us some more insights on the mechanisms why, why the Thanks. why insurance could matter. Thanks. Excellent. Fascinating this uh, data on nightlight and how Christian, uh, as usual, basically explained the application of that. And he has published a couple of papers using this nightlight. And I have a couple of questions also on that. And we used that recently, this new version of nightlight that you mentioned for sanction a story in Iran, publishing remote sensing and uh, have a, a small experience with this data. But of course, you are much more familiar with that and the uh, discussion and question and answer. Hopefully, we have more time to uh, learn more about this. And inshallah, next year, uh, we can approach you for one of our workshop training uh, using this. Uh, so I hope that we can benefit from your uh, knowledge and expertise. So Marcel Toom, uh, is going to talk about mechanism, I suppose, uh, uh, obligatory compulsory insurance against natural disaster. Uh, this is also a very timely topic also in Iran. Also, um, Iran is also a country which is affected by this disaster, many types of disasters. 
Uh, and uh, now uh, there is a serious debate on uh, this insurance uh, issue. And they have already, there is a law which is uh, uh, already implemented this year and would like to know how, what is your suggestion for Germany and to what extent Iran and Germany can learn from each other here. Thank you very much again for coming and uh, presenting this, uh, this uh, topic. It's based on one of your recent uh, contribution in IFU, I suppose, with uh, uh, the colleagues in CESIFU and IFU, and uh, looking forward to learn more about your findings. Okay. Yeah, Mohammed, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Um, as you said, this is not based on a standard academic paper. This is based, based on some uh, policy work I did. So uh, one is a policy paper together with my colleague Joachim Ragnitz, which uh, just comes out in a German uh, policy journal. Uh, and the other one was an op-ed for the Handelsblatt, the German newspaper, together with uh, the president of the IFO Institute, Clemens Fust. Uh, and the question here is, um, does it make sense to have a mandatory or compulsory insurance against uh, natural disasters? Um, so before I start with this question, the question is, do, do we have good economic arguments? Why we should force people to insure themselves? Before I start with this question, just let me uh, show you a picture motivating uh, the problem a little bit. So um, here on the, um, on the left hand side, you see a picture I, I took a few weeks ago when I was in Berlin. Uh, this is a, a street sign here. Um, so I think you can see the point that does it work? Yeah, now it works. Uh, and this street sign says, uh, the English translation is under the water street, um, which already suggests where this is built. Actually, this here in the background, you can see the, um, the rebuilt palace in Berlin, and this street is where the German foreign ministry is. So they have location at the under the water street. And this is a bit small here. This is a street in, in Dresden. Uh, it's the translation is at the flood channel. It should be more properly named uh, actually in the flood channel. Uh, it's really a street in the flood channel. And that's where the, the East Saxon insurance company is located. Um, so it could be a fun fact, but actually they, um, they had some flooding there back in 2002 uh, with huge damages. So um, as you can see, we sometimes build in places that are flood prone, where, where there's a high risk of, uh, of having uh, a damage after a natural disaster. Uh, and clearly not everyone is insured. So here I took a, this is a picture of Germany. And what you see here is the percentage of buildings insured in each of the German states. Um, and it, it ranges from 20 something uh, here in the northern parts of Germany up to 90 percent but this in the southern part this is an exception because they had a mandatory insurance in the past so usually it's in the some, something like a third of the buildings is insured yeah the average here you see is is 46 percent but to, to a large extent driven by baden-württemberg this exception here so the question is if there is such a small percentage of buildings insured and uh, people usually have a large fraction of their wealth in uh, in their houses, in their buildings, uh, is there a good reason why the government uh, should force people to insure themselves? Or could we just leave it to individual decisions? Yeah, so that's that's a question here. And so what we do in uh, in this policy brief, we just go through the standard arguments in economic theory why you may want a mandatory insurance. And I briefly uh, tell you for each of these arguments now um, what what the argument says, and then whether it can be applied to this uh, topic of the uh, natural disaster insurance. And in the end, I will talk about the political economy, because even if we find a good argument in economic theory, uh, it's not clear that we should really um, suggest that as a policy measure, because we don't know what the policy process will make of this suggestion. So let me start with uh, first adverse selection, standard argument in uh, insurance theory. Uh, the main point, the key point here is uh, that insurance markets may break down uh, if uh, one side of the market is better informed than the other side of the market. Here it means the property owners are better informed uh, about the natural disaster risk for their own house compared to what the insurance company knows. Yeah? If, so if that happens, then indeed the insurance market can break down 
because only the high risk uh, properties will be insured, right? If you're a, if you own a house in a low risk region, you would have to pay a very high premium because you have to cross subsidize uh, those who have their buildings in the uh, flood prone areas. So there would be only a small fraction insured, the high risk properties at extremely high premium. But is that plausible for uh, flood risks or other natural disasters, at least in Germany? Maybe we can um, talk about that in discussion, whether different uh, environments uh, may make this argument more plausible. I think for Germany, it's not very plausible because there is a very good information system. It's called the Zurich Geo Information System. Uh, you can, everyone, so also you can do it, you can zoom in in uh, in a map, you can check your own building what the, the flood risk is. So here you can see a river and these are uh, the properties that were flooded in the past. You can also check out the groundwater levels. So there is almost perfect information and this information is also used uh, by uh, the insurance companies uh, who classify buildings according to this search system. So you, here you can see a very small fraction uh, of buildings has uh, at least one flood in 10 years, uh, around 1% of the buildings has uh, one flood in 10 to 100 years and so on. So there, there is a good classification and it's all public knowledge. But if there is public knowledge, there is no asymmetric information. So this is not a very good argument. Uh, what about the second argument? It's called uh, the wealth constraint or kink utility argument. So uh, here, the argument is that if you have wealth constraints, households that are usually risk averse uh, suddenly become risk loving. So this is a, this is a diagram for the economists uh, uh, among you. Uh, so usually we have these concave utility functions. So you would always prefer a safe um, payment compared to a very risky payment, at least yeah, if it's properly designed. But once you reach a threshold where you lose all your wealth, then it doesn't matter anymore for your utility. Yeah? So whether you have a wealth of, I don't know, minus 1,000 or minus 1 million, doesn't matter. For you, it's always zero. Yeah? You're bankrupt. Um, you have no wealth left. Um, and that means, well, you don't care very much about all these negative values. Of course, someone has to pay for it. Yeah? Um, someone else has to pay this negative wealth damage, but it's not you. And then uh, the consequence here is uh, that people may refrain from insuring themselves because they know that, that others have to uh, bear the costs. Is that plausible in the case of uh, natural disasters? Probably not. Yeah, It's very plausible when you talk about, for instance, your car insurance. So here the the claimant, the one who suffers the damage, is not known ex ante. You don't know who will be damaged when you have an accident. So ex ante, um, the claimant is not known. And we have to ensure that because otherwise uh, probably would all care too little about this externality, right? We would cause other people a damage. We can't pay for it because our wealth is not sufficiently large. And that's why we need a mandatory insurance when it comes to driving a car. But here, the uh, claimant is known ex ante. So uh, either it's your own property that is lost or it's the bank's property because you have a credit on your house, you have a loan. Yeah. So um, the, the damaged group is the bank. They might lose their collateral. But of course, if the, um, the claimant is known ex ante, then the, the problem can be solved easily. The, prop, the bank will say, I don't give you a loan if you do not have an insurance. Yeah? So wealth constraints are, I think, not a good argument uh, for mandatory insurance. Um, the third argument, uh, which is often used in, in health economics, is uh, time consistency or time inconsistency. Um, the point here is that even if you have symmetric information, but you learn over time about the riskiness of an object or in health insurance about a, of a person, uh, then these insurance contracts become time inconsistent because uh, the new information, say in this case about the flood risk, um, induces one of the partners to, uh, to terminate the contract. So suppose you learn that your property is much less at risk uh, compared to what you had thought initially. 
Well, then you would like to cancel the existing contract and look for a cheaper, a new contract, uh, which is based on this new lower risk. Yeah, if it's the other way around, um, if um, you learn that your property is, has a much higher risk, then of course you would like to keep the existing contract, but then the insurance company wants to cancel the contract. Yeah? If we have such a situation, it might make sense to have a mandatory insurance where the government forces people to continue their contract. Yeah? You can, cannot cancel your contract whenever you learn something. Is that plausible? No. Yeah? Same, same issue as with adverse selection. This risk status is known and it doesn't change very much over time. So all these standards arguments do not apply. I think there is one argument uh, that is uh, really relevant, and that's the so-called Samaritan's dilemma. What's the point here? Once we have a damage, once we have a flood, uh, the governments cannot refuse to help people. Yeah? Once people have lost their homes, there will be, uh, there will be pictures in the newspaper, uh, there will be reports on TV. Uh, and then a politician cannot say, well, it's their fault, they should have insured themselves, not my problem. You can't do that. Yeah, You can be pretty sure that you will lose the next election if you do something like that. Um, and so all announcements of a government not to help are simply not credible. Yeah, And because the government knows that exposed, it will always have to help, uh, it might be a good idea to force people ex ante to insure themselves. Yeah. Uh, if you do not, if you do not have such a mandatory in insurance, then there will always be a too strong incentive to build in the flood-prone areas. Yeah, if you decide where you build your new home, you might like a nice place at the river because the view is so nice. You can enjoy the water. You can go swimming. Uh, so all the positive benefits accrue to yourself. But if things go terribly wrong and uh, there is a natural disaster then at least a large part of the damage has to be paid uh, by the government or by the taxpayer. Yeah? So there is too much incentive to build close to, to the river compared to fairly safe places far away. Uh, and of course, there is also too little incentive to insure yourself. That's, that's just a consequence of this, this first argument. Okay, so what's the plausibility here? I think this, this is a really plausible argument. Yeah? That's what we have seen in all the floods in, in the past. So whenever there was a, a flooding, then the government had to step in and help. Yeah, just the recent flood uh, in Germany at the Saar, a river in the western part of Germany, yeah, it caused huge damages and the government had to set up a fund, 30 billion euros, huge amounts of money, uh, just to rebuild everything in this area. It's public money, yeah, so of course it wouldn't be zero without insurance, but it would clearly be much smaller if all people uh, were forced to insure themselves. Yeah? So first of all, of course, more buildings are insured. And secondly, people wouldn't build their houses uh, where it's particularly risky. So, so I think this is a very strong argument for a mandatory insurance. But how should this insurance uh, be designed? And secondly, uh, should we uh, trust that the political process really comes comes forward with such a proposal. So this is the political economy uh, of the compulsory insurance schemes. So what, what would be the optimal design? Well, we should have risk-adjusted premia, clearly, because those who build their houses at the river should pay higher prices than those far apart. If we do not have risk-adjusted premia, we do not create the proper incentives. Yeah? Uh, and secondly, there should be high deductibles because for a given property, there is still a lot a homeowner can do. Yeah, It matters whether uh, all your infrastructure, your electricity, your, I don't know, all the, all the technical part is in the basement or under the roof. If it's in the basement, it will be affected by the next flood. If it's under the roof, nothing will or not much will happen. Yeah? So, there is a lot people can do, which is not observable by the government. So I think these two elements are crucial. Otherwise, uh, the compulsory insurance will go terribly wrong. Now, what do politicians usually discuss uh, when they talk about compulsory insurance? They often equate compulsory insurance with uniform premium. Yeah, but of course, I would say it's just it's not the opposite. But you should clearly 
if you have a compulsory insurance, you clearly should not have uniform premia. You should have differentiated premia. Um, but uh, in the end, there is always a huge pressure from property owners, especially in flood prone areas. Why? Well, suppose you own a house, maybe an old house near a, near a river, um, and you know that uh, a compulsory insurance uh, is coming along, then you know you have to pay a very high premium. And this premium is basically is paid by the current owner. So what we know from tax theory is that tax incidence uh, of a tax on houses, or in that case of an insurance premium, uh, is always with the current property owner. Basically, the current owner pays the entire present value of all future insurance premium. Yeah? So that could lead to huge losses in terms of property values. Yeah? So you own a house near a river, it's very nice, but the value is high because also because everyone knows that future damages will be paid by taxpayers. If a compulsory insurance comes, the value of this asset immediately drops. Yeah? So you will, they will lose huge amounts of money and therefore uh, they put a lot of pressure on politicians. So, um, so I'm a bit afraid, even though I think it's a good idea to have a mandatory insurance, I'm a bit afraid that we will end up with uniform premia and low deductibles only. Uh, and that would give an even stronger incentive to build in flood prone areas. And then the outcome would be worse than under the current regime. Uh, where we have no insurance and just live with a Samaritan's dilemma. So that's my message here. Uh, but I'm looking forward to the discussion and maybe uh, there are some more arguments I hadn't thought about. Yeah, so thank you very much for the attention. Looking forward to the discussion. Germany and your suggestion to the policymakers in Germany, and I'm sure that uh, it would be similar question also in case of Iran, which is very um, uh, new to this experience of insurance, obligatory insurance. Uh, but we have also two discussions, uh, Tim and Alexander also uh, may share their views on uh, some of these suggestions that you three mentioned, Francisca, Christian and Marcel, and then uh, we would start uh, uh, open questions from audience who can, by the way, raise their hand also in Adobe Connect, I guess, and we can see if they prefer to ask the question orally. So that is also possible. So team Alexander, please go ahead with your comments, questions. Okay, yeah, shall I go ahead? Or Alexander, would you like to? Okay, so then I'm gonna yeah, start. Excuse me? No. Can I ask a question? Uh, uh, could you? Okay, for you. Okay? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Tim, please. Okay, so first of all, thanks uh, for inviting me to discuss these uh, three very interesting papers. Um, thanks for the excellent presentations. I think they were uh, very clear in their messages and uh, I really enjoyed listening uh, and watching to you. Um, well, I mean, I had a little bit of a problem because these, uh, while well, it's the same topic in some sense, uh, the three papers are of course very different. And so I, I tried to figure out whether there is something uh, I could, uh, or some way of combining um, uh, these three papers and give one comment on all of them. And um, I, I'm not sure whether I'm able to do that, but uh, what struck me was that uh, I think in all three papers, uh, there was a clear economic message and a message that um, refers to, to allocation and efficiency issues. Um, and it seemed to me that in all three cases, it is somehow possible to come up with a market solution that is more or less efficient. Um, in these cases, sometimes you need to have um, some, some government intervention to get uh, things straight. Like uh, Marcel just said uh, that uh, th there are good reasons for, for having uh, an insur a mandatory insurance um, in, in cases of floodings. Um, 
in, in Christian's case, it was probably that um, you need to have some kind of transfer mechanism um, in cases of um, um, re regionally or locally um, occurring uh, earthquakes where those regions that are not affected will somehow support those that are uh, affected. And in Francisca Holz's um, argument, uh, I would say uh, there was this issue that you, that you could basically, for example, buy off uh, uh, these other countries uh, that are reluctant to enter a climate agreement um, by by um, yeah compensating them for the losses, welfare losses or financial losses that come along. But at the same time, I think in in all three cases, uh, we also see these distributional issues that come uh, with these solutions. And following from these distributional issues, there's always some political economy implications uh, that occur. Um, I mean, Francisca Holt's uh, argument somehow reminded me of the Coase theorem, um, saying basically, well, you, you can always find a solution as long as you you uh, have clearly set property rights and, and you just compensate for, for some uh, externalities that occur there. But the problem with the Coase theorem is, of course, always that there is this distributional um, dimension. So those guys who, who own the property rights, uh, they, they will be better off, in a sense, at the end of this process. And the same is true here. So, so you have these, uh, let's say, the richer oil countries, for example, and uh, you buy them off. Um, so what is what is the consequence? Uh, they benefited in the past from having all this oil and selling them to, to the to the global market, contributing to the climate change. And now we are going to pay them for this, for we compensate them to to come somehow um, uh, get their um, agreement to to uh, some climate agree, uh, uh, contract or uh, climate treaty. Now, how do we sell this to the local voters? Uh, can we really convince German voters to give money to Saudi Arabia, for example? I think this is extremely difficult. And so at the end of the day, we will run into this kind of uh, problem that we also see in Marcel's paper, for example. So, I mean, you should have a mandatory, probably have a mandatory uh, flood insurance. But you, of course, want to uh, differentiate by the flood risk of, of the different buildings. But the politicians will not do that because they are afraid of the voters. So at the end of the day, we are running always into this kind of, of problems that uh, voters don't like many of these economic ideas uh, that we come up with. And I think the, the ultimate challenge will be to come up with solutions or at least to convince uh, the local voters that it's really in their own strong interest uh, to uh, to find or or to pay for solutions that they really dislike for not only economic or financial reasons but also for moral reasons, for example, uh, for reasons of fairness. Uh, and so, I think this is really the the big issue that we're going to have. I think there, in many cases, we do have clever instruments to to solve uh, uh, these problems with market solutions. But we need to somehow come up also with these these convincing arguments uh, that that go to the hearts of the people uh, so that they are willing to support these kind of uh, solutions. So and, and I think I leave it with that because, um, yeah, just some short comments um, trying to somehow bring together all three papers. Thanks a lot. your views and then we come to a public question and answer okay alexander could you please also share your yes. views thank you very much i was much impressed and i must say apologies i'm not an economist so for me actually it was a, a bit different to tim probably i was very impressed how neatly all these three very different topics still are unified because I think in Nadima, especially, the focus is on natural disaster risk management. And this morning I was in a session, session with the German uh, Federal Minister, uh, Environmental uh, Agency, 
and they were asking for how to tackle climate change, which is a cross-cutting issue, and which are breaking points to find leverages. And here we have nicely presented three areas to discuss breaking points and leverages. So the first one, I think, the Paris Agreement, that reminded me very much of a discussion of fairness, not only of emission trade and others, but also who are by some chance, you know, the resource rich countries. And I immediately thought, how would those countries feel in an audience who are not amongst the list of the of those premium countries, you know? So do they uh, immediately feel there's a need for a kind of exchange or um, of, of, of benefits, so to say? And that perspective, I think, is important to recognize on which side you are. So I used to be in the climate negotiations with IPCC, and I realized that some countries have organized themselves, the least developed countries or small island development states, to have a voice. Now, I guess that those resource-rich countries already would have some voice by the means of having organizations. And that could be interesting to look in the distribution of power and access, also from the perspective of how have the stakeholders already organized themselves. So a leverage point for a breaking point of fairness could be here, who do you involve and who do you really think has interests in, in finding an exchange and how is this motivated maybe even by economic assessments that open and lay out uh, the problems associated with it. I'm sorry that was a bit fuzzy, but I'm not an economist, so I have different uh, perspectives. I appreciate that the uh, presentation then on uh, the view from outer space very much uh, by Christian Lessmann, because my background is also a bit remote sensing. And that uh, reminded me of the discussion this morning on breaking points and leverage uh, opportunities in terms of is there still need for monitoring and for providing data. I mean something like climate change should be obvious. Something like urban growth and sprawl should be obvious. But still it seems we seem to need more information and more robust information also on other aspects like the availability of electricity which is also a means of showcasing the wealth of a nation. And on the other way around, natural disasters often lead, as you've shown a little bit, uh, to power outages and to problems associated with it. And here we still find a need for more such data. It's in, it seems incredible to, to academia, uh, you know, uh, to call for more data and research. But this was a very nice example showing what can be done. And I think it's a rare resource not used very much yet. And also to the third presentation, my congratulations. And I must say, I have no clue how to ask questions about it because it seems like an old unsolved question. But my take on the breaking point and leverage idea is to think about how nations view compulsory insurance differently. And this could be a great chance to ask the persons in the audience uh, from Iran how you would perceive uh, mandatory insurance uh, or a private insurance, because it could be the case that uh, in Iran it would be interesting to ask if you could be given private insurances in addition, what would motivate you, you know, and which segments of society would be motivated for which reasons, because some might be trusting in government a bit more, some others having more financial resources, others having access to bureaucracy and other means, so I think let me conclude that all three presentations very nicely try to shed light from different perspectives on how to create more leverages to improve natural disaster risk management. Thank you. Disasters. Um... I don't know if you would like to also comment or uh, reflect on uh, some of the presentations that uh, the colleagues have done, and then we go to uh, hear about their feedback on some of these questions shortly, and then, of course, to the audience who may have yeah, also yeah, further sure. questions. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you, all the three presenters. It was really interesting. Uh, especially because, uh, as Dr. Fekett said, um, we are working more with the data and geophysical background. So it's interesting to see 
uh, more about the economy uh, or or um, even the social uh, compulsory um, or so compulsory insurance. Uh, the thing in Iran, uh, we are not dealing just with one hazard. Uh, obviously, you know that we are dealing with flood. Two years ago, we had the worst flood. Um, I don't know in how many years, but it was really, really huge. Most part of Iran was um, uh, dealing with the flooding and um, earthquake is always a problem. So it's not new. We, we are dealing with it every few years on and off. Uh, so we had Manjil earthquake, we had Bam earthquake, and they, uh, they are very famous and we had very problematic situation uh, to deal with the consequences uh, uh, after the earthquake. So they, I, I, I could, I could see uh, specifically the two uh, presentation for the insurance and uh, for the use of data with the light uh, related how they can be related to Iran because it's a big problem for the government and also all the NGO and people to how to to deal with the um, afterward uh, consequence of the earthquake or flooding. So there, there was no compulsory insurance as, as far as I know. I mean, I read um, one, um, it was like a law for the management of the building. So it said that the manager, and in Iran is completely different from Europe or USA. So if you have five story or six stories building, one of the, the, the residents, uh, accept the responsibility and they call the, him or her for one year like a manager. And it's said in the law that he or she is responsible to insure the building. So I read that, that it said it's mandatory. But, you know, there is no, um, um, how I can say, there is no uh, agency or anywhere to come and control or supervise if we do the insurance or not. So if you go to a, all other apartments and say, you know, we have to do this insurance, they say, why we should pay? Or maybe they say we just pay for our, build, for our apartment and I don't want to, to share again. So they say this is mandatory, but I didn't see myself because I'm living here for I don't know how many years. I was born here and I, I grew up here and I didn't see that it's, there is no uh, supervision they, how they apply this insurance. And Dr. Farzanagan, you said that they have this new insurance, uh, compulsory insurance, that they want to apply it in the electricity bill. So again, I see, I don't think that it's going to work very well because, again, um, they didn't ask um, people if they accept it or not. And, and we have different, um, I mean, in each city we have different hazards. So sometimes for Tehran, for example, the earthquake hazard is much higher, the probability is much higher, and risk is much higher. And if, God forbid, it happens, I mean, that big, large earthquake, uh, I don't know how they want to cover because I, I, I prefer not to think about it. It would be a, a disaster, really a disaster. And then for those flooding that we experienced two years ago and even this year, Again, uh, people expect government help them for sure. People, when they are in need, they are in need. They they expect government to help, but there is no um, com concrete way of helping or how they should uh, contribute uh, the aid. And all the time, I see the social effect of this problem. I know the government tried hard because it's really hard to cover, but I see how people are not really satisfied. And I think this uh, insurance uh, for, for the natural hazard, we, we have to do a lot more uh, in, in uh, terms of having how to insure, and especially for those places that are prone to earthquake, to flood for both of them. And now um, more than that, we are dealing also with droughts. So Iran, we have we have lots of problems. So I see this is, I, I think this is a good uh, step to get some idea. Uh, it would be nice to see how we can um, assess, how we can um, justify uh, to find a, a, a policy to 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 uh, uh, assess that city or that place 
that which uh, insurance should be compulsory for that part. Uh, also for that um, earthquake thing uh, with the data that um, was mentioned in the second presentation it was really interesting. Uh, I know for uh, some part like BAM, uh, they try to rebuild the city. Uh, it took for sure long, uh, but I am really interested now to see if we can uh, get more information from those data that uh, Christian said, because still I know there, there are some part that uh, they are struggling. Even for Sarapul as a hub that is more recent, um, still people, uh, they have problem both for the aid that they get from the government or from the NGOs or wherever they come, <laughs> the, the aid comes. And um, also I know still the, the rebuild of the, the city is, is, is like ongoing. And I, I think those part, it's really interesting to see with those data, how these earthquakes uh, or even flood um, contribute to, to uh, the, the economy of those part and the, the quality of life that people are experiencing. So um, thank you again. It was really interesting and um, I love the presentations. And I think this is good to start for, for I hope that uh, this can help us to, to get to uh, a, a rich and concrete or at least helpful way to see how we can do these, um, especially the insurance, because I know for sure that it's a big deal in Iran now. And right after each disaster, I mean, natural disaster, uh, we have really, um, complicated situation, how to deal with those uh, uh, consequences, how we should uh, give the aid to people, how, like, uh, I see uh, for earthquake, even providing residents, um, like, they send some cabinet, they send some tents, and still after so many earthquakes that we had in Iran, still we are not sure which way is the best way to to help people that were affected by earthquake. Uh, I think we can go to the question and answer part if you are agree, Dr. Farzan again, and I just uh, finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Esabi, also for reflection. We have around 15 minutes time. So just about these insurance issues, so I sent a link in the chat room which shows from this year, 2021, after many years of discussion in Iran, so the government decided to um, uh, implement obligatory insurance against natural disaster in the whole Iran. So all 30 million houses, residential houses, now are automatically paying for. I mean, you are right. Uh, you are not asked uh, about whether you accept it or not. I ask also um, uh, one of the family members in Iran, are you aware about these things? So he was not also aware. So I sent the link and said, oh, I need to check the electricity bill. And uh, he realized that there is exactly one item regarding payment to uh, this fund for disaster insurance, 4,000 tomans and 4,000 months. So the government pay 50% of this premium and 50% are paying Iranian households. And the plan is in the next 10 years, the share of uh, owners increased by 90%, the government pay the remaining 10%. But every household pay a similar amount of premium as far as I could read uh, this news. And um, the thing is, but the coverage of damages are very uh, insignificant, especially in urban areas in big cities like Tehran. They pay, in the case of damage, uh, around 30 million tomans, which if you convert it to euro would be 1,000 euro, uh, euro of your household property, which as you can also uh, um, as probably uh, know the prices are quite high in uh, apartment and values of properties. So at the end, uh, the amounts of uh, coverage uh, would not be significant. Uh, but uh, the important is that uh, informing the people about these type of uh, things uh, are not very much uh, working well, so the people are not aware about these uh, policy changes. So, um, so in that sense, uh, we can also go back to the uh, other questions and uh, to see uh, basically if there are questions uh, from audience. Uh, 
of course, if uh, Marcel and uh, Francisca and Christian would like also to reflect on some of the comments received by this cousin and Dr. Esaghi, feel free to do that. Uh, and then we go to the audience as we wish. If there is any urgent comments from speakers who would like to uh, mention on the questions or comments or suggestions by the discussant, or you prefer that we ask the audience about the questions. Okay, good. Um, Yannick, you sent the question, so maybe you also can use the audio and ask your question, Yannick Embrish. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so uh, I have two more minor questions to to Professor Dr. Lesman. Uh, so you talked about nightlight and and assets in in Namibia, and um, you talked about correlation about both uh, variables. Uh, do you know or about which level of correlation we're talking about here? Is it a pretty strong one or or just a minor correlation? So that uh, would be interested for, uh, interesting for me. And as well, you showed uh, the two maps of the earthquake. It was 2005 and, uh, and 2006, I guess, of Pakistan. And uh, you, you highlighted the decrease of nightlight uh, after the uh, disaster. But there was as well at least one point I, I saw quite, quite close to the epicenter of the, of the earthquake where there was an increase in nightlight. So how can you um, or what are the reasons um, we can see an increase there um, as a contrasting development? So that would be interesting to you. Thank you in advance. So, Christian? Yeah, thanks for your question. I'm just, uh, so, um, the correlation between assets and nightlights is not that high. Say it's the R square and the bivariate regression will be about 10%. And if you throw in other regional uh, variables uh, that increases to say about 50 percent so it's um, it's not very high but the, the question is there where's the problem is it the nightlight data and that is particular in rural areas an issue because um, these nightlight products they cut away a lot of light uh, because you cannot distinguish uh, some of these light signals from noise uh, so um, there's a kind of it, it's truncated data. So in in very urban areas, there's a maximum value of the nightlights that will be reached um, in in densely populated areas, and and there's then no variation going on again. And if you're in a very rural area with very low light emissions, uh, it's not clear whether that what the satellite measures is really light emissions by human beings or or it's something else coming from the nature. And so there's also at the bottom a cut of the data. Um, so this correlation between assets and nightlights is not very high, but we have a measurement problem in nightlights. We are working on that uh, to, to um, kind of um, identify really human-made light sources uh, um, in, a, in another project. And then perhaps the correlation in, improves a little bit. But also on the, on the asset side, there's a lot of measurement error going on. So that's a very crude measure we are using here. It's just, you know, uh, how many TVs do you have? in your in your house how many rooms do you have and, and that's it so it's also a crude measure so i would say if we find a correlation in, in a very fine grid that's a good message so obviously the satellite data captures something that it's related to 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 human beings and the living conditions of them but it's not very strong and another point of pakistan is um you know after after such a large shock as it was there that there could be displacement of people. So it mustn't be the case that everything is built up at the same place where the people have initially been living. And if there is a displacement within countries, you, you will see, of course, as a response to the to the earthquake, that, that the kind of distribution of light changes. Yeah? But for us, the interesting case, uh, the interesting question is what happens to the, to the level, uh, the change in the level. And that the change in the level of lights decrease. So obviously there's less economic activity, the less population in that area, but it could of course be that the people relocate in, in from one place to another, and then you see other places getting more enlightened in the nightlights. Well, thanks for the questions. Thank you. Is there any uh, other question regarding the insurance or if something that Hello? you want to share? Somebody? Hello? Yes. Hello. 
could you introduce yourself please and ask your question yes i'm uh, Wahid Shafai. uh thank you very much for your uh presentations all three speakers and discussion and uh, i want just to uh, mention two things that uh dr Eshagi and dr Fekett mentioned of course uh i want to uh, just say this compulsory insurance uh, plan is really good but uh, we should uh, pay attention to some more uh, comments, uh, especially for the less developed country uh, like Iran. Uh, when we discuss about uh, natural disasters, uh, including uh, many disasters and not uh, just a single hazard, when we discuss about the multiple hazards, we should uh, pay attention to these things that uh, these insurance uh, plan uh, should be work on a pre-disaster uh, occurrence and post-disaster occurrence. Uh, it means that when the insurance company wants to insure some, uh, for example, buildings, they should uh, have a plan to supervise the quality of construction, quality of buildings against the occurrence of the earthquake, occurrence of the flood or the fire cascading after the earthquakes. These things uh, is not really uh, easy happen in Iran. Uh, if you just uh, want to insurance the, I don't know, uh, uh, the buildings in the the numerous uh, type in a large scale uh, uh, type of the uh, in the uh, country it is okay well, but just earn some money for the insurance company but uh, what is the warranty for the implementation after the uh, for example such disasters happen uh, especially in Iran uh, lots of years maybe happened uh, and passed and uh, these kind of uh, money gathered uh, from the uh, from the people uh, from different ways uh, for example you you say about the electricity bills or we can do it with the municipality uh, bills that um, in some cases happen in Iran but uh, what is the warranty for implementation in the future uh, when the earthquakes happen there are lots of things happen after the earthquakes uh, large scale earthquakes happen in Iran uh, there are lots of uh, institutes lots of organizations going to come to the field and do something uh, there are some uh, um, construction uh, engineering uh, or you know organization in Iran that when the buildings are going to construct uh, they can uh, issue some uh, for example the construction process but they can of course do for the new built uh, buildings uh, what what about the um, old buildings what about the age of the buildings that uh, they are just construct in the disaster prone areas and we want to have a, a smart insurance some um, buildings have a very high quality and uh, construct in a less uh, prone areas and you are just going to uh, get money from different buildings in a, a similar uh, payments uh, i i just i think that it, it is not fair um, this compulsory or mandatory insurance is okay, but uh, I think uh, because of different disaster, it should have a different responsible, uh, uh, you know, officials and uh, organization that should pay attention to it uh, for the earthquake, for the flood, for the, um, I don't know, fire, tornadoes. These are different uh, criteria that should be uh, considered. Uh, because of that, I think the smart uh, insurance uh, is much more uh, needed and we should pay attention to these uh, aspects. Thank you. Yes, no. So if I talk about mandatory insurance, it doesn't mean it has to be a government organized, governmentally organized insurance. It can be, this can be private insurance companies. Uh, and these private insurance companies, of course, have an incentive to monitor the quality of the building. Yeah, so, but, but of course, yeah, sh sure, you have to control for that. I fully agree.
That's that's correct. I get uh, that's it. The plan in Iran, in this link which I sent in the chat. Uh, of course, the initiator is the government and the central insurance company, which is a public insurance one. But there is no restriction that the other commercial insurance companies also involved in uh, also covering part of these disaster things. And moreover, uh, the household with the low incomes are accepted from payment of uh, premium in this new uh, law in Iran. So they, that would be covered by the government, the households with the low level of income. So um, this is basically also the comments on the insurance. Is there any further comments from the audience uh, who would like to ask uh, from the speakers? Please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Otherwise, I have a question from Francisco also. May I, may I ask a question? Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, if I... Yes, please introduce this is, yourself this and is, ask your question. Thank you. This is Mohammad Khabazan from uh, Technical University of Berlin. And I also uh, affiliated salam with... Uh, salam <laughs> I'm also, also affiliated with DIW Berlin and uh, University of Hamburg. So I was actually very excited when I saw the figure that uh, Francisca showed about um, the uh, recent research by Stanford Energy Modeling Forum uh, 36, which I actually was part of that uh, intercomparison study. And my particular contribution was about some hypothetical you know, emission trading system linking in, in, in the Middle East, uh, specifically uh, in Iran, Saudi Arabia, the rest of um, oil exporting countries and, and the rest of the, the Middle East and the linking with Europe, China, India, and also Russia. So, um, of course, on, on a paper and, and with this like abstract theoretical uh, simulation runs, we can see that um, for example, Middle East or some other oil-rich countries can benefit from, you know, linking their uh, emission trading with, with other parts of the world. And actually, this might be kind of a, a market solution to Tim's uh, comment about whether German people are going to vote to pay to Saudi Arabia. So it might come as a, a kind of solution that, you know, linking this... Um, and going through this uh, market solution may help. However, still, I, th I see like uh, a lot of obstacles here because, you know, within these countries, we already have some uh, big institutional issues. And plus to that, we have this ener uh, energy system transformation. So how, how come we can solve these two issues at the same time? Because I think if we cannot go for a solution for both of them at the same time, you know, going with one and not taking care of the other wouldn't really solve the problem. So I can see that, for example, uh, paying to, um, to, to, to these regions in, in the Middle East would kind of, you know, bring an incentive to reduce the production and, uh, and to reduce their emission, actually. And then they will become very much vulnerable to, like, to, to imports from the rest of the world. And, and some of the countries, especially, for example, Iran, would not really be willing to take that risk to become more in, uh, dependent on imports. Um, so um, it would be good if, if there are some comments on these parts and these obstacles as well. And, I have uh, actually two more comments, which uh, cool. one is uh, so. If you sorry, keep it short. If you keep it short, one might uh, yes, yes. have to be and So there are two two more comments. One is on uh, on Kristen's uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, however, because I have also some integrated assessment background, I would say that calibrating a good damage function, especially a good regional damage function is really hard and then that's the point that cost-benefit analysis may fail to some extent and, and for that reason cost-effectiveness analysis, for example, like keeping just the two degree, uh, to, uh, the global temperature to two degree or 1.5 degrees 
you know, globally offered as, as, as a goal at the moment. So um, that's, that's one of my comments. It would be good if it can be kind of addressed. And the other one is on Marcel's presentation, I, uh, I see that uh, these compulsory insurances might have some benefits, but we are also dealing with 90 and uncertainty. So unknown unknowns, how, how the insurance, uh, you know, organizations and institutions would deal with these problems about some kind of risks that we still don't know about it. And uh, would, would also a compulsory insurance reduce the motivation, you know, within the general society to not go for, you know, mitigation, uh, mitigating the, the global, uh, let's say, warming and some, uh, some, some kind of, uh, you know, um, um, how to how to say uh, build, building some um, some policies against actually going that far to that disasters from uh, from the first place. Thank you very much. I'm sorry Thank for you, my um, long. Uh, <laughs> that's great. I don't know if there is any comments from Francisco. Do you want to reflect on what Mohammed sure, was on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mohamed, for, for, for your questions. Um, I think you very nicely sort of described uh, the problems uh, for, uh, for research-rich countries and countries like Iran uh, how to go forward. Um, there's really a challenge in, in potentially losing revenue and, uh, and potentially even becoming more input dependent. Um, um, I mean, economists have sort of two answers to that, right? The first one is uh, you should go for economic diversification as soon as possible. And of course, that is a very hard uh, to, it's hard to achieve, uh, but uh, sort of tackling that import dependency risk uh, is really um, th that's the first answer that people would give. Uh, but and the other one is uh, sort of maybe easier to implement, but also very hard. We saw in the last uh, decades that we heard that is a, a question of revenue management of as long as you have resource revenues. Um, I mean that's something that uh, obviously countries are struggling with, and there's only Norway, as far as I know, that really has a good. Um, role model of how revenue management uh, can be done so that revenues from resources are kept for future generations and are um, kept for yeah, um, productive uses. Um, and and it's, it's really a, a big and challenging situation and, and nobody has really found a sort of a, a silver bullet solution. That's why we are still stuck with uh, describing the problem and finding even more um, complexities that are making solving the problem harder. Um, and, and the, the same applies probably to what you described um, as, as your scenario, your modeling, that is uh, the CO2 price. Um, I don't quite see a CO2 price being implemented anytime soon in Iran or uh, other countries of the region. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, it would have been a, a sort of a first best uh, solution to tackle climate change and achieve uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction. But the political economy is really, really, really challenging. <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, something related to your presentation, uh, Francisca, because you said this Paris Agreement might uh, also have consequences for all rich economies. It reduced the demand for fossil fuel. It might have a negative shock on their oil income. Can it uh, be one driver of democratization in all rich economies? Because you might argue that these negative oil shocks might increase the uh, willingness of a state to tax the people and uh, you know, increase also this willingness to reform the taxation. And there is this argument that more taxation is associated usually with more sharing political power and accountability and check and balance and things like this. Uh, or in worst cases, it might also lead to some protests because many of these countries are in the power in a form of social contract that they don't tax the people, subsidize, uh, in return for more political affiliation support. So uh, maybe this type of Paris Agreement, these global uh, uh, climate conditions and uh, uh, debates uh, may uh, increase also pressure, domestic pressure in these countries that might in some cases destabilize political system and in worst cases lead to more violence and conflict and things like this. So that uh, that are the arguments that uh, basically uh, one needs to also uh, keep probably in track account when talk about uh, the situation in uh, these countries. But Marcel, you would like also to uh, 
basically what the Mohammed Khabbazan mentioned Erdogan regarding these insurance and motivations and incentives, if you have any comments. So um, that's what they do all the time. Yeah. So I think that's not a big issue. But of course, there could be new types of these disasters we hadn't thought about and which are not insured by standard contracts. And I think this is where uh, Christian's argument comes in. So richer economies are able to self-insure themselves. So, yeah. So if there is something unforeseen, uh, if you're a high income country, you can always deal better with that. So I think that. That's an argument that has always been in the literature. Yeah, you can't insure against everything because some things are not uh, foreseen. But then uh, income helps because uh, then you can have a transfer within the society, which acts like an insurance. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have two, three minutes maybe, and then we conclude the panel because we are uh, now exceeding our plan time. Mr. Maliki has raised uh, his hand, uh, Mustafa Maliki. Um, he was also, Mr. Maliki, if you are here. Okay, I think there is something wrong with the microphone, but the question is in the yeah, box. Dr. Yeah. Person again. Valid. Sorry. The key is in the, the box, question and answer ah, box. In the chat box. Yes, Germany in the new government intends, you, you want to continue? Uh -huh. The question is there, so you, you can read yeah, it. Please, please go ahead, I don't see the Ah, he is. Okay. Uh, he has asked Mr. Maliki, Dr. Maliki, Germany in the new government intends to pursue a stronger climate foreign policy. To this end, new climate partnerships are being established bilaterally and multinationally. How do you see the chances and possibilities that this topic becomes the subject of large scale cooperation between Iran and Germany in the sense of science? diplomacy. I don't know if Francisca or the others have uh, any reflections on or Tim Krieger, Alexander Feketer, you have also good projects with Iran uh, and you are exchanging. What do you think about the new government in Germany and science diplomacy on the topic of climate? You don't have your voice. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I have no idea, to be honest. I think it is an interesting change of the new government and we have to wait how it develops. And I think that the interest in climate change has now grown with this government. And I think since Iran also has a lot of natural hazards and disasters, this could be a good opportunity to open up more cooperation at uh, I, that would be my belief. What the political will is, I have no clue. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, Ms. Mescarani, uh, if you are here and you want to ask your question using audio, please go ahead. And after your question, I think we can then uh, conclude slowly our closing panel, unless that the, the panelists would like also to reflect on some of the comments by the discussant, Tim Krieger and Alexander Fekete. So, Ms. Mescaroni, are you here? No? So, can you use the audio and ask your question, or I should then read it by myself? So you see also the present, I mean, the question and answer box is uh, the question is there. Uh, she's asking, I've just come up with a question about the Paris Agreement. I would like to know if dear Francisca uh, could mention to uh, some pros and cons of joining countries like Iran or other developing countries to this agreement. 
what are the benefit and cost. So that would be probably we need a different season, it's very long. Uh, and uh, she's asking, I had a study on this issue that it is advised that developing countries first reach to financial development and then join this agreement which I see Mohamed Khabazan also shared one of his recent studies on this topic. If you want to um, add to this question and reflect on that, please feel free. Questions, but uh, um, I would certainly think it's uh, advisable for those countries to to join the Paris Agreement. I mean, there is a lot of provisions now that um, that foresee uh, climate finance and, and financial support for developing countries in both uh, climate mitigation for the, for their climate mitigation efforts and also for the climate adaptation efforts um, uh, that will be provided to those countries that are are need and financial need. So I think there's uh, um, good reasons also financially to uh, to, uh, to contribute yeah. to the Paris Agreement. Plus this um, overarching market development that we will see uh, for decreasing uh, demand for fossil fuels. That will happen anyways, uh, and it's not something that a single country like Iran could prevent by not uh, uh, participating in, in the international uh, climate community. So I think it's better for any country to participate in those international negotiations if it's affected anyways. Um, so definitely a, a, a mm -hmm. pro rather, uh, even mm -hmm. though there certainly are clients like uh, a non uh, um, yeah. How can I say that uh, your financial system is disconnected from the rest of the world, so it's. Uh, maybe more that of a problem, you don't have a CO2 price regime, these kind of instruments that are often discussed in international climate uh, arenas, but uh, there's certainly a lot of pro arguments. Thank you. Um, just before concluding, I guess something came in my mind regarding the presentation of Christian uh, on this night light, because night light intensity is capturing both formal and informal economic activities. And have you looked at the, the impact of these disasters, uh, whether it is affecting more shadow economy, informal ec economic activity, or formal economy activities? Because, uh, uh, I mean, what I understand from this night light is the measurement of overall economic things, you know, which could be informal sector or informal sector. Um, maybe future research, I'm not sure if you, in your paper you have separated the impact that natural disaster or these type of shocks might have more strongly on informal economy than the formal economy. Because uh, that could be also maybe interesting to separate uh, given the contribution of shadow economy to many of these developing economies in the term of employment opportunities and things like this and welfare of households uh, to find out which sector is more worse in a term of response to these type of disasters. Yeah, interesting question. I would say that um, I think you know you would need a proxy for the for the official economy at a very local level, which is uh, so GDP. I, I, GDP. You won't, you won't get you won't get the statistical data uh, that you need for it as the. Mm -hmm. As reference, I mean, uh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, it uh, depends how it. how this this aggregated at the province level. For example, we have, I mean, in case of Iran, we have this regional GDP. Huh? That might yeah, work if you believe if you believe that regional GDP. That's <laughs> you know that's yeah. something. That it's like. <laughs> yes, yes. For yes. developing countries, I I really have doubt that you get their valid data that you that is readable and. I think much is definitely in the informal sector. If you think, think on flooding that affects agriculture, for example, that is in developing countries, typically in a complete informal sector. So, so there will be much, much of the informal sector, which is hit in very poor countries. You know, I would say in very poor countries, almost everything is in the informal sector. So Yes. And you know, probably you have also used... That. Correct. You also have used this data for measuring uh, regional inequality, I suppose. That is also a possibility to look at that, how disaster affects income inequality, regional inequality, and things like this. So very good. Dr. Esari, would you like also to have a concluding remarks? And then uh, we finish the Nadimo for this year and hope for a better opportunity for interaction next year in 2022 without Corona. Uh, but 
probably it is less likely, but we can be, <laughs> inshallah, you know, uh, can be optimistic here. So if you want to say something, feel free. Uh, otherwise, uh, we thank all the participants, discussants, and speakers. I enjoy a lot. All presentations, uh, uh, very great uh, talks and very important ones, uh, which are dealing with the timely issues also in Iran. And talking about Paris Agreement, climate situation, and um, these, na uh, these insurance, obligatory insurance that we learned it is already implemented now this year in Iran. So it would be good to see what type of effect we'll have. And this nightlight uh, story is also quite uh, fascinating, fascinating uh, topic for research, uh, especially in the social science and economics. Uh, but uh, you from a strong motion network, you might have the final concluding remarks on this collaboration uh, sure, for this sure. year, of course. Yeah, I, I would like to thank you again, all the, the presenters, the discussion and the participants. Uh, just two small points that I want to mention. Um, I love to see uh, more of this type of uh, conversation. It was really interesting because as I said before, you're more working with the coding the data with the analysis of the data not really going to the uh, social or economic aspect and this is very interesting but i see as a a person who's living in a um, very prone country mm -hmm. to different type of natural disasters and i see how we struggle um, with these type of uh, disasters and post-disaster uh, consequences so I, I think it's really good if we can continue this type of collaboration, especially how we want to implement the, uh, the policies. Um, for example, one point that I realized to mention is that for some part, lots of part of it in Iran, uh, we are dealing with people who are living in uh, villages. And most of the time, um, the income uh, is not that good or is not enough and also they we, we, we did not provide a good uh, um, education in terms of um, 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 teaching people about these type of disasters and then when, if we ask we want to you to pay for insurance for sure they won't accept it so if we could have this collaboration how we can implement this type of obligation in countries like like my country it would be very helpful and interesting because this is new situation iran is completely different from germany and we are going to have more obstacle but it's really interesting and nice to overcome this obstacle as well so thanks again i enjoyed myself i, I am looking forward for more of this discussion and uh, lectures and i am learning myself as well so thank you again uh, uh, of course, if we had more time, we could continue on, and it was really nice, yeah. but unfortunately, we have to finish. So thank you again, yes. and uh, have a good day, everyone. Thanks also. Also from Nadima team who are here, supported all these events. Uh, I need also to thank them, also those who are in Marburg and those in Tehran. Uh, without their uh, the, the support and assistance, these uh, workshops and uh, panels that we were organizing was not possible um so i hope to see you all again in the uh, next events in 2022 either digital or uh, uh, the normal one without uh, i mean with the uh, presence and uh, let's see how these things will develop and uh, uh, plan it then next year so thanks again for people in Iran and Germany and all the speakers and discussants, very great discussions, uh, very helpful. I hope also our presenters also get some uh, also comments useful for their uh, developing Bye. their research in future. Uh, okay, coming to the end and wish you a very pleasant week and uh, also new year. Uh, happy in advance. Why not then? Alles klar. Auf Wiedersehen. Gute Office. Tschüss. Bye bye.